This is But Why, a podcast for curious kids. I'm Jane Lindholm. On this show, we take questions from kids just like you, and we find the answers. Today is kind of special, because today is our 200th episode. That's kind of amazing to me and Melody, because we didn't know we would ever get to 20 episodes when we started this show, and here we are at 200. And to celebrate, we decided we would ask you to send us some of the... I don't know, kind of funny sayings that your adults tell you that get handed down from generation to generation. And boy, did you come through. You always do. We can always rely on you all to send us great things to do for this show. So today, we're going to celebrate 200 episodes by talking about the things that adults say that kids want to know if they're really true or not. All right, so here's a good example of what we're talking about. Hi, my name is Riley. I'm 10 years old, and I live in Northern California. And what my mom say to me are, if you slouch, you'll squish your organs. Moms have eyes in the back of their heads. Don't eat close to bedtime. Caffeine stunts your growth. Hi, but why? My name is Addison. I'm seven years old. I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Why does my dad say that he has eyes in the back of his head? My name is Louise. I live in Berkeley, California. Do parents have eyes in the back of their head? Now, don't tell them I said so, but your adults don't actually have two sets of eyes. So why do they say that? And why does it sometimes seem like they do have eyes in the back of their heads? Well, your adults want to make sure you're being safe, following the rules and guidelines of your home or school, and that you're making good choices. So sometimes they bend the truth to try to help you stay in line by making you think they'll be able to see you doing something you aren't supposed to be doing, even if they have their backs turned. And the thing is, kids... You're not always as sneaky as you think you are. So sometimes parents and other adults can tell, even if they didn't seem to be looking directly at you. And remember, all adults were kids once too. So sometimes it's just a matter of remembering the kinds of things we tried to get away with when we were your age. But sometimes the wild things your adults tell you that seem like they couldn't possibly be true kind of are. My name is Maya, and I'm five, almost six, and I live in Berkeley, California. If you swim, if you don't take a bath in a while, does your hair get green? Here's the scoop. Your hair won't turn a bright green color, but if you have very light-colored hair and you're swimming in a pool with chlorine, Your hair could get a kind of green tinge if you don't get the chlorine out by taking a bath or a shower. But realistically, that only happens after lots of times in the pool. Still, it's not a bad idea to rinse the chemicals off your body after you've gone for a swim. Hi, my name is Caius. I'm seven years old. I live in Benson, Arizona. And uh, my grandparents told my parents that it's bad to shower in a Sunday story. Okay, so this one is really oh truly oh true. Water conducts electricity, meaning electricity, which is what lightning is, can move more easily in water than on land. And the energy from a bolt of lightning spreads out on the surface of the water. So being in water when there's a thunderstorm is potentially dangerous, and you shouldn't do it. Jane, I have something to add here. Oh, hey, Melody. I didn't see you there. Wait, are you in my closet with me? No, I'm in my closet, but hey, look at the computer screen. Oh, hey, Melody, nice to see you. Hey. Okay, so what is it you want to say? I just wanted to offer an interesting fact about lightning and water, which is to explain why it's dangerous for people and not quite as dangerous for fish. When lightning strikes, you mentioned that the electricity or energy spreads out on the surface of the water, but fish are mostly deeper down. So as long as they're not in a puddle, they're definitely going to be okay if they get struck by lightning. So that's why we don't have to get all the fish out of the water, but we have to get ourselves out of the water when there's lightning and thunder. Exactly. Hey, Melody, do you want to stick around and answer some of these other questions that we got with me? Absolutely. But let's bring in another voice to this conversation, too. Lots of you sent us questions about things your adults tell you will happen to or in your body. So we asked somebody who knows a lot more about bodies than us to help us. 
Hello, everyone. Um, I am Dr. Nusheen Aminadeen. I am a pediatrician, which means I'm a pediatrician especially for kids, and I'm really happy to be talking with you today. Dr. Aminadeen works as a pediatrician, that's a doctor for kids, and a professor at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And she also does work answering questions and helping doctors get their messages out to all kinds of people as part of the American Academy of Pediatrics. We thought she'd be the perfect person to talk us through some of what you sent us. My name is Julia, and I live in Cortland, New York, and I am seven. I would like to know why shouldn't we swallow gum? My name is Willis, and I'm eight years old. I live in Montreal, and I want to know why can't I eat bubble gum? Are you eating bubble gum right now? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Evelyn. I'm six years old. I'm from Burlington, Vermont, and my question is, what happens when you swallow gum? I'm Madeline, and I'm six years old, and I am Yaya, and I'm four years old, and we live in Toronto, Canada, and our question is, why don't you swallow gum? Hello, my name is Vivian. I live in Lyons, Colorado. And I am eight years old. My question is, why do people sometimes say if you swallow a piece of chewing gum, it'll be in your body for the rest of your life? I sometimes heard this as a kid, too, and I was told that the gum would stay in my body for seven years if I swallowed it. Seven <laughs> years. <laughs> well, Melody, luckily, Dr. Aminudine says that's not true. Swallowing gum probably isn't going to be a big deal. It's not something I recommend doing because gum really wasn't meant to be ingested. Some types of gums might be a little bit more partially digestible than others, but chances are if you swallow gum, it's just just going to come out the other end without any problems. I mean, you're probably going to poop out the gum. <laughs> so are you going to go out and eat your gum now, Melody? No, I've actually never really liked gum. Maybe it's because I internalized that when I was a kid. But I am glad to hear that if I did accidentally swallow some gum, I'm not building up a little gum graveyard in my stomach. But you're still really not meant to be eating and swallowing gum. So I'm just going to throw it away in a trash can and Remember, kids, in a trash can, not underneath the seat on the bus, not underneath the table or throwing it on the side of the road. Trash can. Trash can. <laughs> All right, trash can. Moving on. Hi, my name is Thomas. I'm seven. And my question is, why do my parents tell me that if you watch too much TV, your brain will turn to mush? Hi, my name is Brandon. I'm eight years old and I live in West Des Moines, Iowa. My question is, why do some people say TV can fry your brain? Hi, my name is Amelia. I am six and three quarters. I live in Durham, North Carolina. My, and my grandma says, if you watch too much TV, you, your brain will turn into jelly. My name is Ian. I live in Holly, Pennsylvania. I'm seven years old. And my question is, why do my parents say if I watch too much TV, I'll become a couch potato? My name is Artin. I'm six years old. I live in Mason, Cincinnati, Mason, Ohio. And my mom says too much TV will make your brain lazy. My name is Ava. I'm eight years old, and I live in San Francisco, California. And my question is, is it true watching too much iPad can fry your brain? What's your name? Silas. How old are you, Silas? Seven. And what is the thing that mommy says to you that you want to know if it's true or false? My mom always says that when I'm watching TV a lot, I'm going to turn into a TV zombie. 
Oh my goodness. The TV question is actually something that I'm very interested in. Um, part of my job as a pediatrician is to talk to kids and their parents about TV and other types of media, whether you're watching something on your phone or a tablet. And the question about does TV turn your brain to mush? Not literally. Not literally. So you don't have to worry about like x rays coming out of the TV that are going to melt your brain. But we do know that if you're spending a lot of time watching TV, it probably means you're not spending time playing outside or being active or learning really cool things, even though TV can have some good learning、uh, material on it too. So we really recommend not spending a whole lot of time in front of a TV and making sure that you're doing lots of other things. That are gonna make you strong and healthy and smart. My name is Haroon. I am seven years old and I live in Bothell, Washington. My mom says if I lie down while watching TV, I will ruin my eyes. Is that true? Hello, my name is Jason. I'm from Chatsford, Pennsylvania. I'm eight years old. My dad says that screens are bad for your eyes. Hello, I'm Eva. I live in Stony, Virginia, and I'm seven years old. Is it too dangerous to sit closer to the TV? Hi, my name is Maya. I'm seven years old, and I'm from Nova Scotia, Canada. My question is, why do my parents say it's bad for your eyes to watch a screen before bed? That's also a really good question. We have learned that the blue light、um, from tablets,、uh, which people sometimes use right before they go to bed, can activate parts of your brain that can make you more awake. So even if you are looking at a tablet and you're reading a book from a tablet or something else,、um, That you think is relaxing and might normally be relaxing for you, that blue light, which your brain can't control seeing, is probably going to make it a little bit harder for you to sleep. So, pediatricians usually recommend putting away any sort of electronic devices, cell phones, smartphones,、uh, tablets, and TV at least an hour before bed, if not longer. And as for being bad for your eyes in general, most doctors say it's unlikely you'll have permanent eye problems from looking at a screen. But you can still make your eyes feel really tired and strained. And sometimes when we're focused on looking at something, we wind up not blinking as much, which can dry out our eyes and make them feel kind of scratchy or blurry. So it's always a good idea to take a break from the screen, look at something farther away, and do some good blinking. Hi, this is John from Atlanta, Georgia. When I was a kid, my mom told me not to read in the dark because it would hurt my eyes. Is that true? This is kind of the same thing as watching a screen for too long. If you read in the dark, you can really strain your eyes. It takes a lot of work for your eyes to pick up words on a dark page if the light is very low and it can tire them out. So your eyes can hurt a little bit or feel a little bit itchy, or it can give you some blurry vision for a while. Maybe your mom just didn't want you to stay up too late. <laughs> I am Easton. I am five years old. I live from Canada, and I wanna know if you watch TV before bed, you will have bad dreams. So the question about whether or not you will get bad dreams、uh, based on what you watched on TV depends. If you're watching something really scary before you go to bed, it's possible that your subconscious mind, which is the part of your mind that's still active when you're asleep, could still be thinking about that, and that could give you bad dreams. So I recommend not watching anything too scary, not watching anything that's too stimulating, which is another word for something that gets you really excited. And active right before bed because that can also make it so that it's harder to fall asleep. But for some people, if they notice that things are scary and that's giving them bad dreams, I would just recommend not watching those kinds of programs at any time. Do you know what I've been told will give you bad dreams, Melody? What? Eating cheese right before bed. Cheese? I mean, that's what people say. But there's actually a study going on right now to try to see if that's true. The people who are running the study are paying folks to eat cheese before bed and then keep track of their dreams. How do I get in on that? <laughs> well, this is a study that's being conducted by a mattress company, not scientists who have to follow really strict guidelines for research. So, I would say we should take the results with a grain of salt. But I am interested to hear what they come up with. Totally. All right. Well, we're talking about sleep. Here are a few more sayings that you've sent us. Hi, 
My name is Itamar and I'm 10 years old. I'm from Tzoran, Israel, and my question is, why do my parents say that I won't grow if I don't sleep enough? Oh, interesting. That's Dr. Amina Dean again. So we know that sleep is really important for lots of reasons. You actually need sleep um, for your brain to work the way it should so that you can learn. Um, we also know that sleep is really important in what we call mood regulation, which means kind of keeping you happy and keeping you from, you know, having too many ups or downs or feeling really grumpy when, when you're tired. Um, but we also know, and we've learned more recently, that sleep is actually actually a very important time for your body to heal, like your body actually needs rest. It's not healthy for a person to just go, 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 and, and not get enough sleep, whether you're a kid or you're an adult. Um, and when you sleep, that actually is something that helps your immune system, which is the part of your body that helps you fight off infections. Um, it helps your immune system function better. And we found that when people don't get enough sleep, um, they are more likely to, to catch more colds, more viruses, you know, and, and other things. Um, so a, I don't know specifically if that is, 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 is directly related to growing tall, but we know that there are lots of good reasons to sleep and some we probably haven't discovered yet. So I would recommend listening to your mom or your dad when they tell you it's important to sleep at night. If you want to know more about sleep and dreams, we did two episodes, one on each topic a few years ago, and they're really interesting. So ask your adults to help you find them in whatever podcast app you're using to listen. There's plenty more still to come. You've sent us a lot of superstitions, parental myths, and some outright falsehoods. So we're going to keep on sleuthing out the truth. This is But Why, a podcast for curious kids. I'm Jane Lindholm. And I'm Melody Baudet. And today we're learning from all of you what sayings, myths, and superstitions your adults have passed down to you that may or may not be true. Here's one that I hear and say a lot, especially here in the wintertime in New England. My name is Maya. I am turning nine in five days. I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and my urban legend is if you stand outside with wet hair in the cold, you'll get sick. My name is Penelope. I'm six years old. I live in Charlottesville, Virginia. Is it true that you get a cold if you go outside with Hi, my name is Joey, and I am 10 years old. I live in Hillsborough, New Jersey, and my question is, is it true if you go to bed with your hair wet, you'll get sick? My name is Jasper, and I'm 4 years old, and I'm from California. My mom says I can't go to bed with my head wet, otherwise I'll get sick. My name is Nora. I live in Tacoma, Washington, and I am six years old. And my mom says with you, when you go outside with your hair wet, you'll catch a cold. Bye! I love your show! And a parent named Melissa and kid named Carter sent us this one, too. So here's what Dr. Aminuddin has to say. So I remember when I was little, my parents told me never to go out with wet hair. Um, and I think there's a good reason for that, because when you go out with wet hair, um, you can you can get really cold and you can shiver. And if it's cold enough, like it is right now in Minnesota, your hair can freeze. But the question about whether or not you can actually catch a cold, which is really a cold virus, is probably not something that's going to happen unless you come into contact with someone else who also has a virus. Not everyone who has a virus or who has, you know, a cold, as we normally call them um, is going to show symptoms. And sometimes people are most contagious before they ever show symptoms. So chances are, if you happen to be outside, if you happen to have wet hair, but you're around someone who has a cold virus that then, you know, comes to you and you get infected, it's going to be from the virus, but not from the cold or wet hair. All right. So you can't catch a cold from the cold, but if you get too cold and get hypothermia or frostbite, that can cause other problems. So it's still a good idea to bundle up. Speaking of which. My name is Evelyn and I live in Deerfield, Massachusetts, and I'm five years old. Why do adults say, always say that you'll catch a cold if you don't wear hats, snow pants and mittens in the cold? <laughs> 
I think wearing a hat can help keep you warm, and that's very important when you live in in a place where it's cold, uh, as I do. But it's not necessarily going to prevent you from getting sick because viruses, which are a type of germs, are what make you sick. Okay, so now we know you aren't more likely to get a cold just from being out in the cold. But Jeremy, a parent, and Judah, a kid, wrote to ask us about this one that you might have heard. Put a hat on when it's cold because most of your body heat leaves through your head. Melody, have you heard that one? I have definitely heard that one. And it turns out it's false. You don't lose more body heat through your head than through other parts of your body. There was an experiment done in the 1950s where soldiers were sent out with everything but their heads covered. And... They lost a lot of body heat through their heads, but that was because their heads were the only things uncovered. I mean, that makes sense. I guess you kind of lose heat from your whole body equally, and your head is only like 10% of your body, so you probably wouldn't lose 90% of your heat that way. No, definitely not. Here's another one. My name is Fiona. I'm nine years old. I live in Naperville, Illinois. My question is, why do you get seven years of bad luck if you break a mirror? This one is what's called a superstition. That's a belief in something magical that doesn't have a basis in science or fact, or a way of using magic to explain something that feels unexplainable. The idea that breaking a mirror means seven years of bad luck appears to have come from the ancient Romans, who believed that reflecting surfaces like mirrors might be magical. So breaking one was really bad luck. But they also believed that a person's soul would be renewed every seven years, so the bad luck could only last that long. That's pretty cool. But needless to say, superstitions are not rooted in science or fact. They're just beliefs, and sometimes they're fun. And sometimes people don't even believe them, but they enjoy the fun of that. Things like that if you spill salt, it's unlucky, but if you throw a pinch of it over your left shoulder, you'll break a curse. Those are kind of fun, but not true. I still do that, though. I still like to throw the salt over my left shoulder. It's just kind of fun, right? (laughs) That's not one I do. (laughs) All right, let's move on. Hi, my name is Ella. I live in Beverly, Western Australia. I'm seven years old. I wonder why my nana always says I have my guts up for gardens. Melody is a little bit horrified by this one and had never heard it before. So why don't I tackle this one? If you can picture your guts, they're like long tubes all kind of coiled up inside your body. And a garter is an old-fashioned piece of clothing. It's a little round piece of fabric that you pull up on your leg and tie to hold your stockings up. So the phrase, I'll have your guts for garters, is an old-fashioned threat. You'd better not do whatever it is they don't want you to do, or they'll take your guts out and use them as garters. You can actually find references to this saying as far back as 500 years ago. Hi, I'm Marcus. I'm four years old, and I live in Dallas, Texas. My grandma says... The nail on my middle finger grows the fastest. Is she right? When I first heard your question, Marcus, I thought the answer was going to be something like, don't be ridiculous. But it turns out your grandma is right. I didn't know this one either, but... Your longer fingers grow faster than your shorter fingers, so your index finger, that's the one you point with, and your middle finger grow the fastest, and your thumb and your pinky nail grow the slowest. That's so wild to me. I had no idea. And another thing that I didn't know, Melody, is that the nails grow faster on the hand you use more. So if you're right-handed, your fingernails on your right hand will grow faster, and if you're left-handed, the fingernails on your left hand will grow just a little bit faster. Right, and your fingernails grow a lot faster than your toenails, presumably because you're using your hands more than your feet. (laughs) Yeah, mind blown. Thank you, Marcus, for sending that one in. Hi, my name is Samma. I'm five years old. I live in Kensington, Maryland. And my question is, why don't my mom and dad let me cut my nails at night? This is another one we had fun researching. This superstition is popular in a lot of countries in Asia, including Korea, Japan, the Philippines, and India. There are lots of explanations for this superstition, and it's different from culture to culture. Some of them are about bad luck if you cut your fingernails at night, um, but some are actually kind of dark and a little bit scary. But remember what we said earlier about superstitions? 
they're based in a belief in magic or the supernatural. And this one doesn't have any real scientific reasoning behind it. Except, I guess, that you wouldn't want to clip your nails in the dark in case you accidentally cut your finger. Here's one that we heard from a lot of you. Hello, my name is Hannah, and I am 10 years old, and I am from South Korea. Can a watermelon seed grow in someone's stomach? My name is Maisie, and I'm 6 years old, and I live in Pennsylvania State College. Hello, our names are Alex. Say your name. I am a Lorenzo. I am eight years old. Lorenzo is four years old. I fought a years old. We live in Houston, Texas. We live in Houston, the sky and the sky. Stop, stop, stop. Hey, y'all, my name's Sebastian, and I live in California, and I'm five. My name is Timmy, and I am six years old, and I'm from Vancouver, Canada. Is it true that seeds will grow in your stomach if you eat them? To get a little help with questions like these, we enlisted the help of a pediatrician, a doctor who treats kids, named Nusheen Aminadine. She says you don't have to worry that you might be growing a tree inside of you right now. (laughs) That is not true. Um, As someone who has eaten lots of watermelons and lots of other fruits and vegetables that have seeds in them and who's eaten like seeds and nuts themselves, nothing has ever grown in my stomach. And there's a good reason for that. Number one, in order for seeds to grow, they need really specific conditions. They need nutrition. They need moisture. They need light. Um, And in your stomach, the first thing that happens after after you eat something and it goes down your esophagus, which is kind of your food pipe, uh, and it goes to your stomach, is it meets with acid. And the acid is something that kind of helps break things down partially. Um, that's one of the f- earlier parts of digestion. And chances are seeds are not going to survive that well enough to, to be able to do anything, much less be exposed to the, to the nutritious dirt um, and sunshine and other things that plants need to grow. Hi, my name is Eleanor. I live in Edmonton, Alberta. I am six years old. Why do grown-ups say if you eat too much food before swimming, you might sink? Hi, I'm Heather. I am seven years old. I live in Round Lake, Ontario. And my question is, why do you have to wait an hour before you go swimming? So I think the reason people tell people not to swim after eating is because if you've eaten a meal, especially if you've eaten a really big meal, you know how full you can feel and how sometimes it feels like your stomach is so full that the food is almost coming up to to the top of your throat. Well, if you exercise very vigorously, which means like really, really intensely, um, it can sometimes make you feel a little bit sick to your stomach. I think the worst thing that could possibly happen if you exercise too soon, especially after a big meal, is you might throw up. Um, But otherwise, there's nothing terrible that's most likely going to happen to you if you if you exercise or swim a little a little too soon. Hi, my name is Hudson, and I am five years old, and I live in Bellamy, Australia. And my question is, why does my mummy tell me to spit on my mozzie bite? Uh, I have been bitten by lots of mosquito bites, and I was never taught to spit on them. From a medical standpoint, I don't think that would make any difference. What happens when mosquitoes bite you is you also get um, a little bit of a reaction that makes you itch. And I don't think that there's anything in your spit that would make it itch less or that would make it go away. Um, If something's really itchy, you can talk to your parents and they can probably give you a little cream that makes it itch less. But I don't think spit's going to do anything for you. My name is Matan and I live in the part of work in Israel and I'm six years old and my question is why when parents why do parents say that when you yell in someone's ears then they will hurt your ears? We know that sometimes really loud noises can cause damage, sometimes temporarily, sometimes more permanently. And so it's a good idea not to yell in people's ears. Um, Chances are it's not going to be loud enough on one attempt to to create a problem. But we do know that 
people who use earbuds or who have um, their headphones turned up too loud can over time develop some hearing loss. So I would recommend not yelling in anyone's ear also because it's not very nice. Hi, my name is David and I'm 11 and I live in Belmont, Massachusetts. And uh, something that my grandma says is that uh, if you stand too close to a microwave, then you'll get harmful radiation. Hi, my name is Lily. I'm six years old. I'm from Seattle, Washington. And my mom says standing in front of a microwave is bad for you. Is that true? Lily's little brother, Rowan, also wants to know the answer to this. And so do I. When I was a kid, way back in the 1980s, microwaves were just starting to get really popular. And I was always told not to stand in front of one and watch your food cooking because it was dangerous. So I want to know, am I allowed to look? You can definitely watch your food rotating around in there without fear, Jane. Microwave ovens work by using electromagnetic waves. Basically, they cause the water molecules inside of your food to vibrate, which heats them up. Whoa, that's cool. Way cool. And it's safe to stand there and watch because microwave ovens are designed to keep all that energy inside. When you open the door of the microwave, it immediately stops cooking, right? And if you look closely at the window of a microwave, you'll see that it has a metal mesh. And that metal mesh prevents the energy from escaping. And the government regulates the production of these cooking appliances. So unless your microwave's broken, you're not really in any danger. Hi, my name is Karis. I'm 10 years old. I live in Virginia. And um, my question is, why does my mommy say I'm going to fly out the window with my when I have my seatbelt on? Hmm. This one confused me a little bit. Karis, do you mean your mommy says you might fly out of the window if you don't have a seatbelt on? That's what I think you must mean, and here's what I think your mom is talking about. First off, let's just say seatbelts are one of the most important public health and safety inventions out there. They save thousands of lives each year. If you get into a car accident, they can make it much less likely that you're going to get severely hurt. So you should always wear your seatbelt. But I think your mom might be kind of joking with you that if you have the window down so you can feel the breeze on your face, that the wind could just suck you right out the open window if you weren't belted down. That's not really true. The wind won't suck you up and out of the car. But you wouldn't want to lean your body out of the car window because that would be unsafe. So I think the bottom line here is that you're safer off listening to your mom and wearing your seatbelt, whether your window is open or down, but you're not going to be sucked out by the wind. Hello, my name is Alex. I'm eight years old and I live in South Lake, Texas. And I'm Renata and I'm Alex's mom. My mom always tells me, that playing musical instruments makes you better in math. We're going to put this one in the category of maybe. Studies have found that students who play a musical instrument do do better in math testing, but the studies have not shown that the music study is why those students are doing better in math. Maybe there's another reason those students do well in those two subjects. Maybe they're doing better at music because they're better at math. Maybe it's a difference in the way those people think that makes them better at both music and math. So the reason to play an instrument should be because you love it, not because it might make you better at math. Melody, these are so much fun, but I think we have a lot more still to go, don't we? Absolutely. And I think we might want to take a little break here and come back next time with more. Yeah, let's split this into two episodes so everybody doesn't get exhausted listening to all of these. And so we're going to come back in two weeks with even more sayings from your adults. So stick with us. And we're also going to invite Dr. Nusheen Aminuddin back as well. She teaches and works in the Department of Pediatrics at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. But Why is produced by me. I'm Melody Baudette. And I'm Jane Lindholm. We're produced at Vermont Public. And distributed by PRX. Our theme music is by Luke Reynolds. As we mentioned, we'll be back in two weeks with an all-new episode. So until then... Stay Stay curious. curious.